Autobiography of Anthony Trollope. Chapter 5. My First Success. 1849-1855. I had at once gone to work on a third novel, and had nearly completed it when I was informed of the absolute failure of the former. I find, however, that the agreement for its publication was not made till 1850, by which time I imagine that Mr. Colborne must have forgotten the disastrous result of the O'Kellys, as he thereby agreed to give me twenty pounds down for my new historical novel to be called La Vendée. He agreed also to pay me thirty pounds more when he had sold three hundred fifty copies, and fifty pounds more should he sell four hundred fifty within six months. I got my twenty pounds, and then heard no more of La Vendée, not even receiving any account. Perhaps the historical title had appeared more alluring to him than an Irish subject, though it was not long afterwards that I received a warning from the very same house of business against historical novels, as I will tell at length when the proper time comes. I have no doubt that the result of the sale of this story was no better than that of the two that had gone before. I asked no questions, however, and to this day have received no information. The story is certainly inferior to those which had gone before, chiefly because I knew accurately the life of the people in Ireland, and knew, in truth, nothing of the life in the lavande country and also because the facts of the present time came more within the limits of my powers of story-telling than those of past years but i read the book the other day and i am not ashamed of it the conception as to the feeling of the people is i think true the characters are distinct and the tale is not dull as far as i can remember this morsel of criticism is the only one that was ever written on the book I had, however, received twenty pounds. Alas, alas, years were to roll by before I should earn by my pen another shilling. And, indeed, I was well aware that I had not earned that, but that the money had been talked out of the worthy publisher by the earnestness of my brother, who made the bargain for me. I have known very much of publishers, and have been surprised by much in their mode of business by the apparent lavishness and by the apparent hardness to authors in the same men, but by nothing so much as by the ease with which they can occasionally be persuaded to throw away small sums of money. If you will only make the payment future instead of present, you may generally twist a few pounds in your own or your client's favor. You might as well promise her twenty pounds. This day, six months, will do very well. The publisher, though he knows that the money will never come back to him, thinks it worth his while to rid himself of your importunity at so cheap a price. But while I was writing La Vendée, I made a literary attempt in another direction. In 1847 and 1848 there had come upon Ireland the desolation and destruction, first of the famine and then of the pestilence which succeeded the famine. It was my duty at that time to be travelling constantly in those parts of Ireland in which the misery and troubles thence arising were, perhaps, at their worst. The western parts of Cork, Kerry, and Clare were preeminently unfortunate. The efforts, I may say the successful efforts, made by the government to stay the hands of death will still be in the remembrance of many how Sir Robert Peel was instigated to repeal the Corn Laws, and how subsequently Lord John Russell took measures for employing the people, and supplying the country with Indian corn. The expediency of these latter measures was questioned by many. The people themselves wished, of course, to be fed without working, and the gentry, who were mainly responsible for the rates, were disposed to think that the management of affairs was taken too much out of their own hands. My mind at the time was busy with the matter, and, thinking that the government was right, I was inclined to defend them as far as my small powers went. S. G. O., Lord Cindy Godolphin Osborne, was at that time denouncing the Irish scheme of the administration and in the Times, using very strong language, as those who remember his style will know. I fancied then, as I still think, that I understood the country much better than he did, and I was anxious to show that the steps taken for mitigating the terrible evil of the times were the best which the minister of the day could have adopted. 
in eighteen forty eight i was in london and full of my purpose i presented myself to mr john forster who has since been an intimate and valued friend but who was at that time the editor of the examiner i think that that portion of the literary world which understands the fabrication of newspapers will admit that neither before his time nor since has there been a more capable editor of a weekly newspaper as a literary man he was not without his faults that which the cabman is reported to have said of him before the magistrate is quite true he was always quote, an arbitrary cove unquote. as a critic he belonged to the school of bentley and gifford who would always bray in a literary mortar all critics who disagreed from them as though such disagreement were a personal offence requiring personal castigation but that very eagerness made him a good editor into whatever he did he put his very heart and soul during his time the examiner was almost all that a liberal weekly paper should be so to john forster i went and was shown into that room in lincoln's inn fields in which some three or four years earlier dickens had given that reading of which there is an illustration with portraits in the second volume of his life at this time i knew no literary men a few i had met when living with my mother but that had been now so long ago that all such acquaintance had died out i knew who they were as far as a man could get such knowledge from the papers of the day and felt myself as in part belonging to the guild through my mother and in some degree by my own unsuccessful efforts but it was not probable that any one would admit my claim nor on this occasion did i make any claim i stated my name and official position and the fact that opportunities had been given me of seeing the poor houses in ireland and of making myself acquainted with the circumstances of the time would a series of letters on the subject be accepted by the examiner the great man who loomed very large to me was pleased to say that if the letters should recommend themselves by their style and matter if they were not too long and if every reader will know how on such occasions an editor will guard himself if this and if that they should be favorably entertained they were favorably entertained if printing and publication be favorable entertainment but i heard no more of them the world in ireland did not declare that the government had at last been adequately defended nor did the treasurer of the examiner send me a check in return whether there ought to have been a check i do not even yet know a man who writes a single letter to a newspaper of course is not paid for it nor for any number of letters on some point personal to himself i have since written sets of letters to newspapers and have been paid for them but then i have bargained for a price on this occasion i had hopes but they never ran high and i was not much disappointed i have no copy now of those letters and could not refer to them without much trouble nor do i remember what i said but i know that i did my best in writing them when my historical novel failed as completely as had its predecessors the two irish novels i began to ask myself whether after all that was my proper line i had never thought of questioning the justice of the verdict expressed against me the idea that i was the unfortunate owner of unappreciated genius never troubled me i did not look at the books after they were published feeling sure that they had been as it were damned with good reason but still i was clear in my mind that i would not lay down my pen then and therefore i determined to change my hand and to attempt a play i did attempt the play and in eighteen fifty i wrote a comedy partly in blank verse and partly in prose called the noble jilt the plot i afterwards used in a novel called can you forgive her i believe that i did give the best of my intellect to the play and i must own that when it was completed it pleased me much i copied it and recopied it touching it here and touching it there and then sent it to my very old friend george bartley the actor who had when i was in london been stage manager of one of the great theatres and who would i thought for my own sake and for my mother's give me the full benefit of his professional experience i have now before me the letter which he wrote to me a letter which i have read a score of times it was altogether condemnatory when i commenced 
he said. I had great hopes of your production. I did not think it opened dramatically, but that might have been remedied. I knew then that it was all over. But as my old friend warmed to the subject, the criticism became stronger and stronger till my ears tingled. At last came the fatal blow. As to the character of your heroine, I felt at a loss how to describe it, but you have done it for me in the last speech of Madame Brudo. Madame Brudo was the heroine's aunt. Margaret, my child, never play the jilt again. Tis a most unbecoming character. Play it with what skill you will it meets but little sympathy and this be assured would be its effect upon an audience so that i must reluctantly add that had i been still a manager the noble jilt is not a play i could have recommended for production this was a blow that i did feel the neglect of a book is a disagreeable fact which grows upon an author by degrees there is no special moment of agony, no stunning violence of condemnation. But a piece of criticism such as this, from a friend, and from a man undoubtedly capable of forming an opinion, was a blow in the face. But I accepted the judgment loyally, and said not a word on the subject to anyone. I merely showed the letter to my wife, declaring my conviction that it must be taken as gospel and as critical gospel it has since been accepted. In later days I have more than once read the play, and I know that he was right. The dialogue, however, I think to be good, and I doubt whether some of the scenes be not the brightest and the best work I ever did. Just at this time another literary project loomed before my eyes, and for six or eight months had considerable size. I was introduced to Mr. John Murray, and proposed to him to write a handbook for Ireland. I explained to him that I knew the country better than most other people, perhaps better than any other person, and could do it well. He asked me to make a trial of my skill, and to send him a certain number of pages, undertaking to give me an answer within a fortnight after he should have received my work. I came back to Ireland, and for some weeks I labored very hard. I did the city of Dublin and the county of Kerry, in which lies the lake scenery of Killarney, and I did the route from Dublin to Killarney, altogether completing nearly a quarter of the proposed volume. The roll of manuscript was sent to Albemarle Street, but was never opened. At the expiration of nine months from the date on which it reached that time-honored spot, it was returned without a word in answer to a very angry letter from myself. I insisted on having back my property, and got it. I need hardly say that my property has never been of the slightest use to me. In all honesty, I think that, had he been less dilatory, John Murray would have got a very good Irish guide at a cheap rate. Early in 1851 I was sent upon a job of special official work, which for two years so completely absorbed my time that I was able to write nothing. A plan was formed for extending the rural delivery of letters, and for adjusting the work which up to that time had been done in a very irregular manner. A country letter carrier would be sent in one direction, in which there were but few letters to be delivered, the arrangement having originated probably at the request of some influential person, while in another direction, there was no letter carrier because no influential person had exerted himself. It was intended to set this right throughout England, Ireland, and Scotland, and I quickly did the work in the Irish district to which I was attached. I was then invited to do the same in a portion of England, and I spent two of the happiest years of my life at the task. I began in Devonshire, and visited, I think I may say, every nook in that county, in Cornwall, Somersetshire, the greater part of Dorsetshire, the Channel Islands, part of Oxfordshire, Wiltshire, Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Herefordshire, Monmouthshire, and the six southern Welsh counties. In this way I had an opportunity of seeing a considerable portion of Great Britain, with a minuteness which few have enjoyed, and I did my business after a fashion in which no other official man has worked at least for many years. I went almost everywhere on horseback. 
I had two hunters of my own, and here and there, where I could, I hired a third horse. I had an Irish groom with me, an old man who has now been in my service for thirty-five years. And in this manner I saw almost every house, I think I may say every house of importance, in this large district. The object was to create a postal network which should catch all recipients of letters. In France it was, and I suppose still is, the practice to deliver every letter. Wherever the man may live to whom a letter is addressed, it is the duty of some letter carrier to take that letter to his house, sooner or later. But this, of course, must be done slowly. With us, a delivery much delayed was thought to be worse than none at all. In some places we did establish posts three times a week, and perhaps occasionally twice a week, but such halting arrangements were considered to be objectionable, and we were bound down by a salutary law as to expense, which came from our masters at the treasury. We were not allowed to establish any messenger's walk on which a sufficient number of letters would not be delivered to pay the man's wages, counted at a halfpenny a letter. But then the counting was in our own hands, and an enterprising official might be sanguine in his figures. I think I was sanguine. I did not prepare false accounts, but I fear that the postmasters and clerks who absolutely had the country to do became aware that I was anxious for good results. It is amusing to watch how a passion will grow upon a man. During those two years it was the ambition of my life to cover the country with rural letter carriers. I do not remember that in any case a rural post proposed by me was negatived by the authorities, but I fear that some of them broke down afterwards as being too poor, or because in my anxiety to include this house and that, I had sent the men too far afield. Our law was that a man should not be required to walk more than sixteen miles a day. Had the work to be done all on a measured road, there would have been no need for doubt as to the distances but my letter-carriers went here and there across the fields. It was my special delight to take them by all shortcuts, and as I measured on horseback the shortcuts which they would have to make on foot, perhaps I was sometimes a little unjust to them. All this I did on horseback, riding on average forty miles a day. I was paid sixpence a mile for the distance travelled, and it was necessary that I should at any rate travel enough to pay for my equipage. This I did, and got my hunting out of it also. I have often surprised some small country postmaster, who had never seen or heard of me before, by coming down upon him at nine in the morning, with a red coat and boots and breeches, and interrogating him as to the disposal of every letter which came into his office and in the same guise I would ride up to farmhouses or parsonages or other lone residences about the country and ask the people how they got their letters, at what hour, and especially whether they were delivered free or at a certain charge. For a habit had crept into use which came to be, in my eyes at that time, the one sin for which there was no pardon, in accordance with which these rural letter-carriers used to charge a penny a letter, alleging that the house was out of their beat, and that they must be paid for their extra work. I think that I did stamp out that evil. In all these visits I was in truth a beneficent angel to the public, bringing everywhere with me an earlier, cheaper, and much more regular delivery of letters. But not unfrequently the angelic nature of my mission was imperfectly understood. I was perhaps a little in a hurry to get on, and did not allow as much time as was necessary to explain to the wondering mistress of the house, or to an open-mouthed farmer, why it was that a man arrayed for hunting asked so many questions which might be considered impertinent as applying to his or her private affairs. "'Good morning, sir. I have just called to ask a few questions. I am a surveyor of the post-office. How do you get your letters?' As I am in a little hurry, perhaps you can explain at once. Then I would take out my pencil and notebook and wait for information. And in fact there was no other way in which the truth could be ascertained. Unless I came down suddenly as a summer storm upon them, the very people who were robbed by our messengers would not confess the robbery, fearing the ill will of the men. 
it was necessary to startle them into the revelations which i required them to make for their own good and i did startle them i became thoroughly used to it and soon lost my native bashfulness but sometimes my visits astonished the retiring inhabitants of country houses i did however do my work and can look back upon what i did with thorough satisfaction i was altogether in earnest and i believe that many a farmer now has his letters brought daily to his house free of charge who but for me would still have had to send to the post town for them twice a week or to have paid a man for bringing them irregularly to his door this work took up my time so completely and entailed upon me so great an amount of writing that i was in fact unable to do any literary work from day to day i thought of it still purporting to make another effort and often turning over in my head some fragment of a plot which had occurred to me but the day did not come in which i could sit down with my pen and paper and begin another novel for after all what could it be but a novel the play had failed more absolutely than the novels for the novels had attained the honour of print the cause of this pressure of official work lay not in the demands of the general post office which more than once expressed itself as astonished by my celerity but in the necessity which was incumbent on me to travel miles enough to pay for my horses and upon the amount of correspondence returns figures and reports which such an amount of daily travelling brought with it i may boast that the work was done very quickly and very thoroughly with no fault but an over-eagerness to extend postal arrangements far and wide. In the course of the job I visited Salisbury, and whilst wandering there one midsummer evening round the purlieus of the cathedral, I conceived the story of the warden, from whence came that series of novels of which Barchester, with its bishops, deans, and archdeacon, was the central site i may as well declare at once that no one at their commencement could have had less reason than myself to presume himself to be able to write about clergymen i have been often asked in what period of my early life i had lived so long in a cathedral city as to have become intimate with the ways of a close i never lived in any cathedral city except london never knew anything of any close and at that time had enjoyed no peculiar intimacy with any clergyman my archdeacon who has been said to be lifelike and for whom i confess that i have all a parent's fond affection was i think the simple result of an effort of my moral consciousness it was such as that in my opinion that an archdeacon should be or at any rate would be with such advantages as an archdeacon might have and lo an archdeacon was produced who has been declared by competent authorities to be a real archdeacon down to the very ground and yet as far as i can remember i had not then even spoken to an archdeacon i have felt the compliment to be very great the archdeacon came whole from my brain after this fashion but in writing about clergymen generally i had to pick up as i went whatever i might know or pretend to know about them but my first idea had no reference to clergymen in general i had been struck by two opposite evils or what seemed to me to be evils and with an absence of all art judgment in such matters i thought that i might be able to expose them or rather to describe them both in one and the same tale the first evil was the possession by the church of certain funds and endowments which had been intended for charitable purposes but which had been allowed to become income for idle church dignitaries there had been more than one such case brought to public notice at the time in which there seemed to have been an egregious malversation of the charitable purposes the second evil was its very opposite though i had been much struck by the injustice above described i had also often been angered by the undeserved severity of the newspapers towards the recipients of such incomes who could hardly be considered to be the chief sinners in the matter when a man is appointed to a place it is natural that he should accept the income allotted to that place without much inquiry it is seldom that he will be the first to find out that his services are overpaid 
though he be called upon only to look beautiful and to be dignified upon state occasions he will think two thousand pounds a year little enough for such beauty and dignity as he brings to the task i felt that there had been some tearing to pieces which might have been spared but i was altogether wrong in supposing that the two things could be combined any writer in advocating a cause must do so after the fashion of an advocate or his writing will be ineffective he should take up one side and cling to that and then he may be powerful there should be no scruples of conscience such scruples make a man impotent for such work it was open to me to have described a bloated parson with a red nose and all other iniquities openly neglecting every duty required from him and living riotously on funds purloined from the poor defying as he did so the moderate remonstrances of a virtuous press or i might have painted a man as good as sweet and as mild as my warden who should also have been a hard-working ill-paid minister of god's word and might have subjected him to the rancorous venom of some daily jupiter who without a leg to stand on without any true case might have been induced by personal spite to tear to rags the poor clergyman with poisonous anonymous and ferocious leading articles but neither of these programmes recommended itself to my honesty satire though it may exaggerate the vice it lashes is not justified in creating it in order that it may be lashed caricature may too easily become a slander and satire a libel i believed in the existence neither of the red-nosed clerical cormorant nor in that of the venomous assassin of the journals i did believe that through want of care and the natural tendency of every class to take care of itself money had slipped into the pockets of certain clergymen which should have gone elsewhere and i believed also that through the equally natural propensity of men to be as strong as they know how to be certain writers of the press had allowed themselves to use language which was cruel though it was in a good cause but the two objects should not have been combined and i now know myself well enough to be aware that i was not the man to have carried out either of them nevertheless i thought much about it and on the twenty ninth of july eighteen fifty three having been then two years without having made any literary effort i began the warden at tenbury in worcestershire it was then more than twelve months since i had stood for an hour on the little bridge in salisbury and had made out to my own satisfaction the spot on which hiram's hospital should stand certainly no work that i ever did took up so much of my thoughts on this occasion i did no more than write the first chapter even if so much i had determined that my official work should be moderated so as to allow me some time for writing but then just at this time i was sent to take the postal charge of the northern counties in ireland of ulster and the counties meath and louth hitherto in official language i had been a surveyor's clerk now i was to be a surveyor the difference consisted mainly in an increase of income from about four hundred fifty pounds to about eight hundred for at that time the sum netted still depended on the number of miles travelled of course that english work to which i had become so warmly wedded had to be abandoned other parts of england were being done by other men and i had merely finished the area which had been entrusted to me i should have liked to ride over the whole country and to have sent a rural post letter carrier to every parish every village every hamlet and every grange in england we were at this time very much unsettled as regards any residence while we were living at clonmel two sons had been born who certainly were important enough to have been mentioned sooner at clonmel we had lived in lodgings and from there had moved to mallow a town in the county cork where we had taken a house mallow was in the centre of a hunting country and had been very pleasant to me but our house there had been given up when it was known that i should be detained in england and then we had wandered about in the western counties moving our headquarters from one town to another during this time we had lived at exeter at bristol at caermarthen 
at Cheltenham, and at Worcester. Now we again moved, and settled ourselves for eighteen months at Belfast. After that we took a house at Donnybrook, the well-known suburb of Dublin. The work of taking up a new district, which requires not only that the man doing it should know the nature of the postal arrangements, but also the characters and the peculiarities of the postmasters and their clerks, was too heavy to allow of my going on with my book at once. It was not till the end of 1852 that I recommenced it, and it was in the autumn of 1853 that I finished the work. It was only one small volume and in later days would have been completed in six weeks, or in two months at the longest, if other work had pressed. On looking at the title page, I find it was not published till 1855. I had made acquaintance, through my friend John Merivale, with William Longman, the publisher, and had received from him an assurance that the manuscript should be looked at. It was looked at, and Monsieur Longman made me an offer to publish it at half profits. I had no reason to love half profits, but I was very anxious to have my book published, and I acceded. It was now more than ten years since I had commenced writing the McDermott's, and I thought that if any success was to be achieved, the time surely had come. I had not been impatient, but if there was to be a time, surely it had come. The novel reading world did not go mad about the warden but I soon felt that it had not failed as the others had failed. There were notices of it in the press, and I could discover that people around me knew that I had written a book. Mr. Longman was complimentary, and after a while informed me that there would be profits to divide. At the end of 1855, I received a check for nine pounds eight shillings, eight pence, which was the first money I had ever earned by literary work that twenty pounds which poor Mr. Colburn had been made to pay certainly never having been earned at all. At the end of 1856 I received another sum of ten pounds, fifteen shillings, one pence. The pecuniary success was not great. Indeed, as regarded remuneration for the time, stone-breaking would have done better. A thousand copies were printed, of which, after a lapse of five or six years, about three hundred had to be converted into another form and sold as belonging to a cheap edition. In its original form, the warden never reached the essential honor of a second edition. I have already said of the work that it failed altogether in the purport for which it was intended, but it has a merit of its own a merit by my own perception of which i was enabled to see wherein lay whatever strength i did possess the characters of the bishop of the archdeacon of the archdeacon's wife and especially of the warden are well and clearly drawn i had realized to myself a series of portraits and had been able so to put them on the canvas that my readers should see that which i meant them to see there is no gift which an author can have more useful to him than this and the style of the English was good, though from most unpardonable carelessness the grammar was not unfrequently faulty. With such results I had no doubt but that I would at once begin another novel. I will here say one word as a long-deferred answer to an item of criticism which appeared in the Times newspaper as to the warden. In an article if I remember rightly, on the Warden and Barchester Towers combined, which I would call good-natured, but that I take it for granted that the critics of the times are actuated by higher motives than good-nature. That little book and its sequel are spoken of in terms which were very pleasant to the author. But there was added to this a gentle word of rebuke at the morbid condition of the author's mind which had prompted him to indulge in personalities the personalities in question having reference to some editor or manager of the Times newspaper. For I had introduced one Tom Towers as being potent among the contributors to the Jupiter, under which name I certainly did allude to the Times. But at that time, living away in Ireland, I had not even heard the name of any gentleman connected with the Times newspaper, and could not have intended to represent any individual by Tom Towers. As I had created an archdeacon, so I created a journalist, and the one creation was no more personal or indicative of morbid tendencies than the other. 
if tom powers was at all like any gentleman connected with the times my moral consciousness must again have been very powerful end of chapter five